Hi, I'm Bob Masago. Welcome to this in-studio session on WNRN. We're at In Your Ear Studios in Richmond, welcoming B.J. Barm from American Aquarium. We want to thank him for coming in. Let you know a couple of things about him and the band. They'll be playing tonight at the National in Richmond. Doors are going to open at 7 o'clock, and the show starts at 8 o'clock. The band also has a new album out now. I'm going to give you two details on it, but I'm going to give the most important detail over to B.J. to describe. The new album is available on 30 Tigers record and uh, Losing Side records. It's out now, but the title of the album, because it's so unfamiliar to so many people, I'm going to let you say it first, BJ. The title of the record is Chickamacomico. See? See how easy that is? See how it just rolls off the tongue so naturally. Congratulations on the new record. To me, it sounds like a a very mature album. Thank you. Uh, It's a a, a deeply personal record. Um, it's a record about loss. It's a record about the last couple of years, especially my last couple of years. Um, but what I've found when I started playing these songs for other people was that other people experienced quite a bit of loss over the last few years, whether it was time or actually people or friends or parents or loved ones. Uh, it became a little, it took a lot of the power that that loss had over me away. Like the seeing that other people were going through the same stuff and these songs were kind of helping them get through it just as much as the songs were helping me get through it. So that was a, a powerful thing. And, and we knew putting this record out was going to be, a, it's a heavy record. It's a really heavy record. And um, it's just been really fun to watch how these songs uh, kind of fit in, nestle in with the rest of our back catalog pretty well, um, surprisingly well. Um, it's just been a real treat. Yeah, I've really enjoyed listening to it, and I can't imagine how powerful it's going to be to hear you give us one of those songs. Would you mind doing one now? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to play you the title track first, um, and then we'll talk about it, I guess. Great. This is a song called Chickamacomico. Pack up your bags, babe. We're going for a drive. No, I can't tell you where that would ruin the surprise Yeah, this winter just won't end Lord knows what we've been through It's been the kind of year that damn near broke us clean in two So let's head down to the shoreline and wash off all this blame Swim out past the breakers Just to curse the maker's name And try to find that piece of us We lost all those years ago Out on the sinking sands Of Chickamacomico And I swear I'm gonna lose my mind If I have to hear about God's plan one more goddamn time I'm just staring at the sky Begging for an excuse Yeah, I never knew hard until I took a part That room that never got used So let's head down to the shoreline And wash off all this blame Swim out past the breakers Just to curse the maker's name And try to find that piece of us We lost all those years ago Out on the sinking sands Of Chickamacomico And I'll never pretend To know what you're going through But you ain't the only one Who lost some that day Honey, I lost him too So let's head down to the shoreline And wash off all this blame 
Swim out past the breakers Just to curse the maker's name And try to find that piece of us We lost all those years ago Out on the sinking sands Of Chickamacomico That's B.J. Barham of American Aquarium with us in studio at Inner Ear Studios in Richmond. The title song, Chickamacomico, from the new album, as I said, the title of Chickamacomico. Losing Side Records, available through 30 Tigers. You can also see American Aquarium this evening at the National in Richmond. Doors opening at 7 o'clock and show at 8 o'clock. Great song, B.J. Really enjoyed that. Thanks so much. So did you have a place you traveled to a lot? Um, not really. Um, I, I've been very fortunate. Um, the last couple records, I get to kind of go on a writer's retreat somewhere and kind of hole up for a week and a half, two weeks. I take my family with me. And then during the day, I just write all day from the time I wake up to dinner time. And then after dinner, I cook dinner and we all kind of hang out as a family. So with our last record, Lamentations, we did it up in Waynesville, North Carolina, the mountains of North Carolina. I wrote Lamentations up there. But for this one, we went to the Outer Banks. Um, and Chickamacomico, um, we were, I wrote this record in a town called Rodanthe, North Carolina, the northern tip of Hatteras Island out on the Outer Banks. And uh, every day I would go for a run midday to kind of reset, clear my head. And there was a giant water tower that said Chickamacomico. I was like, that's so weird. That's not the name of the town we're in. Like that's a, we're in Rodanthe. I know we're in Rodanthe because the address. Um, and I kept running by it, so finally it kind of piqued my interest. And I, when I got home, I, I Googled it, and I realized that Chickamacomico used to just be the name of that entire northern tip of Hatteras Island. Uh, and then back in the 60s and 70s, the United States Postal Service decided that it was too hard to spell and pronounce. So they changed it to Rodanthe, Waves, and Salvo. So that whole strip of small town, beach towns, became uh, something else. And I thought, what better title for a record about loss than an entire town that kind of lost its name, lost its identity, lost its... Because, you know, Chickamacomico obviously is a native word. It means sinking sand. It was Algonquin um, for the people that settled that area. And uh, and then it just gets stripped away and replaced with something like... There's a beach town literally called Waves. <laughs> That's the best they could come up with. And, and Rodanthe, which I think is equally hard to spell and pronounce if you don't know what it is. Um, so I, I, very quickly I realized that was going to be the title of the record. And, uh, and that song I'd been looking for, so that song is about a couple experiencing a miscarriage. And it was something me and my wife went through about six years ago. And uh, I wrote that, that line, um, I swear I'm going to lose my mind if I have to hear about God's plan one more goddamn time. I wrote that line and just I didn't have anything else to go with it. I was like, man, that's a really good line. And then a couple months later, I wrote the staring at the sky, begging for an excuse. I never knew hard till I took apart that room that never got used. And I had a verse, but I didn't have any sense of place. I couldn't, I didn't have the song. I didn't have the narrative. Um, And then on that trip, uh, by seeing that word Chickamacomico every night, every day on my run, I decided to write this kind of story about a couple that goes on a beach trip to try to reconnect and, and kind of shed that blame and shame that comes with a miscarriage. If anybody out there has went through that with their, their partner, um, it's hard on both sides. Communication breaks down. There's this weird unspoken gap in your relationship. And I wanted to write about the trouble, about how, how hard it is to reconnect after something like that. I, it, like inimaginable loss. And so once I had a setting, that first verse wrote itself that, you know, pack up your bags, we're going for a drive. And then the chorus um, is very much from that run, those runs I took every day, seeing that water tower, such a unique word, such a ridiculous, I didn't have to worry about anybody else having a song called Chickamacomico. I didn't, I I got to have a pretty original idea there because there's not too many people that would want to either try to pronounce that uh, in a song or, or try to rhyme something with it. So I, I felt really good when I could squeeze that in phonetically. I felt, as a writer, I patted myself on the back for that one. 
as well. You should. You know, I always thought, I thought that was a very powerful song when I heard it. But thanks for sharing the story behind it because it makes it even more powerful. Thank I think. you. Thank you. You know, you've been pretty fortunate to not have to stray too far from home to pursue your career. How do you think you how have you managed to avoid like having to move to a music town? Uh, my dad always taught me to grow where you're planted, and I, and I, and, I, and I always stuck with me. Not just because it sounds kind of poetic, but because it's true. Um, I think my career would have been a lot easier if I moved to Nashville or Austin or New York or any kind of major. Raleigh, North Carolina, is not a musical hub. Uh, it's not what you think of when you think of like I'm gonna I'm gonna move to Raleigh and make it. Um, <laughs> I ended up in Raleigh because I went to North Carolina State University. Um, so I moved. I grew up in Reedsville, North Carolina, right there on the Virginia state line. Um, Danville would be our sister town across the border. Um, and then I moved to Raleigh when I was 18, and there was kind of not really a music scene there. Uh, and we quickly realized that the only way we were going to make it in the music business was to tour, to travel. We had to take the message to people. And so for about 10 years, we toured stubbornly. Like we were playing 300 shows a year in every menu venue from North Carolina to California and back. Uh, people were eating pizza, and we are just up there singing depressingly sad songs while they're eating their meal. We felt like a really sad version of like a Chuck E. Cheese. <laughs> we were just kind of like these giant animatronic rats who were singing songs about loss and relationships going horribly wrong while people were trying to just enjoy their meal on a Tuesday night. Um, but eventually, we turned that into five people coming to see us, turned into 10, turned into 20, turned into 100, turned into a couple hundred. And it started building itself. And I don't know if it would have built itself if we just had moved to a music town and tried to, you know, be discovered. Mm -hmm. I think what really made our band special was the work ethic, was the taking it to the street and, and touring relentlessly and building a fan base the proper way. We didn't build a fan base through a top 40 single or a viral music video. We built a fan base from connecting with people on a nightly basis and doing so in such a way that they felt the urge to share it with other people, to bring somebody else the next time we came through town and for them to bring somebody. And here we are, you know, 16 years into our career, we've built a kind of a neat thing because nobody else can take credit for it except for us. And that's the, I, I, it's, it's the joy of owning a small business because that's all we are. We're a small business. We just have, it happens to be a really cool business. But we're a small business, and we take a lot of pride in the fact that we built it from the ground up and that nobody else can take it away from us. Um, I don't know many bands 16 years in. We own 100% of everything we've ever recorded. Nobody owns any of our music except for us. And I think I wear that as a badge of honor just as much. Yeah. Like the sold-out shows are great and all, but the fact that we built this thing ourselves um, with the help of a really incredible fan base um, is, a, is a pretty special thing. And it allows me to... Stay in North Carolina. We were joking earlier. I've never lived more than an hour and a half from where I was born. And North Carolina holds such a special place in my heart. Um, I get to travel around the world and see some of the greatest cities the world has to offer, but I get to come back home. And I get to, and that's special to me, is being able to call North Carolina home because so many musicians have to move to the Nashvilles and the Austins mm -hmm. and the LAs of the world. And I feel very fortunate that I was able to build to carve out my own nook of the music business and do it all from Raleigh, North Carolina. It's a neat thing. Yeah, that's incredible. Uh, I've got another question I want to ask you yeah. about touring, but I'm going to save that because I know everybody would like to hear another song from yeah, the new album sure. if you'd share one. For sure. This is uh, arguably the hardest song I had to write for the record um, in a record of hard songs. Um, I lost my mom on New Year's Eve of 2019. Um, such a usually such a, a joyous holiday. You know, you're ending a year, you're putting all the transgressions of the past year behind you, and it's a fresh start, it's a new start. Like uh, I'm always optimistic on New Year's Eve. Um, I'm not jaded yet. I'm not to the point where I'm like, whatever I promise myself, I'm just gonna back out of on January 10th. I, I still tell myself that I'm gonna stick with it. But uh, I got a call at 9 p.m. that night, and it was from my dad, and my dad doesn't call a lot, and he definitely doesn't call after the sun goes down and so I knew it was a bad call and um, I always thought that losing my mom would be the day I lost my mom would be hard but it wasn't hard it was easy um, it was shock 
your body hasn't fully registered it yet. And I thought the funeral was going to be hard. And the funeral wasn't hard because you're surrounded by a couple hundred people that loved your mom and they tell these really great stories and you're surrounded by love and family. Like that wasn't hard. The hard part was the first holiday that I associated with my mother. Um, that was difficult. It was, it was my birthday. My mom always called me the exact minute I was born. That was her thing. She would call me every year the exact minute I was born and tell me that, you know, like 36 years ago, you ruined me and your father's life. Like in a joking way, like in a very loving, joking way. But the first, first birthday that came, and I didn't get that phone. And God bless him, my dad tried, but he, he was like an hour and a half late. Um, but the first birthday that came, and my mom didn't call, it became real to me. And for my dad, it was, it was his wedding anniversary. Um, and then every holiday that comes after that, you know, the Thanksgiving where there's an empty seat at the table and nobody wants to talk about it. Um, all of that kind of shaped into this song um, about that first year of losing someone that is, is instrumental to your, your life. And, uh, and this is a song from a mom called The First Year. It's finally here that time of year when your favorite flowers start to bloom. And the showers of April cascade into the sauna we call June. Yesterday was my birthday, the first one since you've been gone. All my friends say it gets easier. All my friends have been known to be wrong And you left in such a hurry I had so much left to say Now I'm just passing by Thought I'd stop and say hi And that I miss you Happy Mother's Day Yeah, the two of you said I do July 4 of 76 and It was all sunshine and rainbows Till you threw a couple babies in the mix A shining example Of what love could truly be But like a castle made of sand I watched that mountain of a man Fall apart when they laid to rest his queen And you left in such a hurry I had so much left to say Yeah, I'm just passing by Thought I'd stop and say hi And that I miss you Happy Independence Day Last New Year's Eve was like no other new And you never think you'll get that call Till that call comes knocking at your door You left in such a hurry I had so much left to say Yeah, I'm just passing by Thought I'd stop and say hi that I miss you Happy New Year's Day B.J. Barham is with us in studio on WNRN <laughs> Thanks, yeah. A 
That song is well worth applause. He and his band American Aquarium are playing tonight at the National in Richmond. That show starts at 8, doors open at 7 o'clock, and that's another song from the new record, Chickamacomico, out now on through 30 Tigers Records on Losing Side Records. I can't, I can't imagine anybody hearing that song who's gone through any of that kind of, that kind of loss isn't going to be moved by that one. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, that's the one that, when the record came out, I got a bunch of messages from people. And, and you know, when you write something that personal, that vulnerable, um, the minute you write it, you question if it's too much. If you, it, do you, the goal when you're writing songs is to kind of, it's a tightrope act. You're trying to walk that line between being transparent and honest, and then there's the other side of it, which is too much information. You're too honest, you're too exposed, too personal. And so as a songwriter, you try to learn, and that's part of the craft is learning how to walk between being honest but also keeping enough of yourself away from it to where you can play it every night, and it's not a breakdown song every night. And, and that's one of those songs where when you finish it and you play it for people and you see how they react to it, you realize that they're applying it to their story because that's an extremely personal song for me. But it's so rewarding watching other people take that trauma and that loss and apply that song to it, and it, it becomes their song. It becomes a song about their dad or their sister or anybody they lost over the last few years. And that's, as a songwriter, it makes diving into that kind of dark corner and pulling that out, it makes it that much more rewarding because nobody wants to talk about this kind of stuff. Nobody wants to talk about suicide and overdose and miscarriages and losing people especially in today's country music. Today's country music's all about, you know, Friday nights, pretty girls, dirt roads, big trucks. <laughs> and I like to kind of explore those, those darker corners of the Southern experience, the stuff we're not supposed to talk about at the dinner table. Um, I think it's important because when you pull that stuff out of the corner, out of the dark corner, and you drag it into the light and you give it a name and you make everybody look at it and make everybody talk about it, that kind of trauma and loss loses its power over us. And I think that's very important because when you can get an entire fan base like ours talking about miscarriages and talking about losing a parent and it takes that power, you're not alone anymore. You're even more a part of this community. And I think it's important. Um, and I think that's kind of the purpose of this record. The purpose of this record isn't put it on and have fun. <laughs> God knows anybody who puts this record on and has a good time. I don't know if I want to hang out with you. <laughs> this is a record I, I hope people listen to, you know, by themselves and they feel things and they explore a lot of what's stuck inside of them. But maybe it's a 20 year old loss that is, you've, you've kept just down inside and hopefully this helps bring it to the top and, and helps you deal with it. But Songs like this, I think, are just as important as the songs that make us feel good, the songs that make us face-to-face -face with that kind of loss. I think it's important. Yeah, I think you're right. I have one more question about writing a song like that one. For you, there's got to be a lot of emotional release in it. it. Does the release come from the writing of the song or the performing of the song or both? It's, it's cathartic to write it, for sure. To put it on paper, it feels good. It's therapy. It saved me a lot of money. <laughs> in, in therapy sessions, just writing stuff down. But the like you said, the really rewarding part is singing it every night because, like I said, the, the, the first time I sang that song in front of people, I broke down middle of the song. Couldn't sing it. Like, choked up, was crying on stage in front of a 1,000 people. Um, second time, a little choked up. Third time, not as much choked up. Now, 100 times in, I can sing that song through, and I... I I still fall into that place, but it's not, it's taking the power away from it. I, like I, I talked about earlier, it's, it's, it's helping me deal with it. And the more I can sing that song and not completely break down and lose it, um, it means I'm dealing with it. And I think that's the rewarding part is singing it. And, and again, looking out in the crowd at night and I'm playing that song and you see men and women of all ages sobbing. That's how you know you did your job as a songwriter. When you can make somebody feel that deep of an emotion to where they're crying in public. They're literally just standing in front of you sobbing. That is how you know 
that you did the right thing by writing that song, walking that tightrope, putting yourself out there, because you putting yourself out there allows somebody else to join you out there. And I think that's extremely important when it comes to songwriting. I agree. I know that you had a heck of a day. You traveled down here from Boston, I think <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah, we were in Boston last night, which uh, on a map looks way closer to Richmond. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> than it actually is. There's this thing called DC traffic, apparently. Uh, we left at 12.30 last night and got into town today about 12, 10, 12.30. And got here about 12.13 then. Yeah, like, yeah. Like, like literally as the bus pulled yeah. up, my buddy Joey picked me up and uh, as the bus pulled up, I jumped off the bus with my guitar, got in a car and came straight here. So, um, but we're here though. We really didn't know if we were going to make the show. We were like, I really just hope we can be there before doors open. Um, but yeah, it's uh, we were in Boston last night, and we got two more shows. Uh, we're here in Richmond tonight at the National, which is a beautiful, beautiful room. Um, and then we've got a pretty equally heinous drive tonight uh, to Louisville, Kentucky. Um, and then we wrap. Uh, actually, I have a day off, and then I have to fly to Colorado for a day, but... Flying is, a, well, I'll take that back. Flying's not as easy as driving these days. Flying is just as tumultuous. But uh, And then I've got a couple weeks off with my family. So um, we're on the tail end of the first leg of this tour. So I'm sure you're looking forward to that time off. And I know that you had a very long day, but do you think you could share one more song with us? Of course, of course. Okay. Uh, keeping in the spirit of, of, of <laughs> heaviness, um, I wrote this song about a buddy of mine I grew up with that I lost over the last year. Um, this is one of those songs about uh, not answering those phone calls from the people you know are troubled and the people you know need you to answer those phone calls and the guilt that comes when there's no more phone calls to answer, when you finally get word that they're gone uh, and you're wondering if you did enough or if you, did, if you, if, if you could have done more. Um, or if you'd answered that phone call, if they'd still be here. And uh, yeah, this is a song called Waking Up the Echoes. How's your mama now? Hadn't seen your folks in ages. She was always kind, had the best sweet tea high school meat ever tasted. Weddings and funerals used to always bring me down. These days they seem to be the only thing that ever bring me back to town. And I wish you'd have called me. Maybe I could have talked you down. But the thing that I wish most of all is that you were still around. Can't help but laugh about all the trouble that we got Into in the back of that short sugar's parking lot All the life we lived, all the plans that we discuss Before Milwaukee's best snuck up and got the best of us And I wish you'd have called me Maybe I could have talked you down But the thing that I wish most of all Is that you were still around Still hear your voice when I cross that county line Waking up the echoes in the canyons of my mind I'll hold on to the good times, leave the bad ones for the plow It ain't goodbye forever, friend, it's just goodbye for now And I wish you'd have called me Maybe I could have talked you down but the thing that I wish most of all is that you were still around 
I wish that you were still around. BJ Barham from American Aquarium. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Let me point out American Aquarium is going to be playing at the National tonight in Richmond. They'll be playing at 8 o'clock. Should doors open at 7. And the new album, Chicken McComico, is out now on 30 Tigers Records. They've also got a couple of albums of uh, 90s country covers out there, too. I love the title of the, the, the two volumes. What is it? Slappers, Bangers, and Certified Certified Twangers. Yep. Slappers, Bangers, and Certified Twangers, Volume 1 and 2. Uh, it's an ode to my love of 90s country, <laughs> cheesy 90s country. Uh, I've been threatening the band with these records for 10 years, and uh, if the pandemic gave us anything, it gave us time. <laughs> and uh, giving me time is a very dangerous thing because <laughs> I, will, I will use it to the fullest. And so we got together and we recorded 20 of our favorite 90s country songs. Um, and I told the boys, I'm like, we're gonna release the first volume, uh, and if it flops, we will not release the second volume. Uh, so we released volume one and we completely underestimated the demand for that record. It was, it happened in the middle of the pandemic and all of a sudden it was, it wasn't serious. It was just a bunch of guys in a studio having fun, playing songs that reminded them of being young. Um, and we tapped into something extremely, uh, potent. We found like a, one of the strongest drugs in the entire world, I, I truly believe is nostalgia. And we tapped into that nostalgia, and we we offered people a couple doses of sitting in the back of your dad's truck, going grocery shopping, listening to Joe Diffie and Trisha Yearwood, and it was it was a real special record for me to make because my dad loved those records. Like my, my my dad was like, "This is the greatest thing you've ever done." I was like, "Thanks, Dad. Uh, I didn't write any of these," uh, but uh, it, it it was really fun to see people, and it, it's been really kind of neat now that we're back on the road to see how many people found those cover records and had no idea who American Aquarium was. And then that has led them to our catalog, which has led them to come to the live shows, which I never thought that, you know, singing Sammy Kershaw songs would bring somebody to the table, but here we are, um, and, I'm, and I'm very fortunate. And I think the best part of those Slappers and Bangers records were I think about 75% of the artists we covered either texted or emailed and reached out and told us how much they appreciated our version of the songs. Um, so you can imagine like eight, how excited eight-year-old me would be for like, you know, Patty Loveless to send me an email being like, I loved your version of my song. I'm like, <laughs> I loved you forever, Patty Loveless. Uh, you know, so it was, it was really neat. Um, and, I've, and, and, a, and a few of those artists, Sammy Kershaw, uh, Sawyer Brown, they've become friends. Like they, we comment on each other's social media posts, and it's been kind of neat to uh, a mutual appreciation for each other's craft. And, uh, so yeah, those were a lot of fun to make. How nice! If you, if anybody has any trouble finding them, I'll point out that everything's available on their website, AmericanAquarium.com. Again, the show is at eight o'clock tonight. The National in Richmond. The new album is out, available now. Chickamacomico. BG, I know you got stuff to do this afternoon. I really appreciate you stopping by here today. And uh, it's it's great to hear that music from you directly. Oh yeah, you got you guys got to hear the uh, the way the songs were written. Just a guy and his guitar in an empty room singing them. <laughs> so it's always fun to strip them back down to this version. This is thanks for the opportunity. Well, it's our pleasure. Thanks to all of our VIP members for showing up today, and I'm sure you have a round of applause for for BJ here. Thank <laughs> you. Okay. Thanks to. Thanks to Andrea and Carlos and the rest of the crew from In Your Ear Studios for the use of this beautiful facility, all of our WNRN staff. Again, BJ, thank you very much. I'm Bob Masago. Thanks for listening. It's an in-studio session at WNRN.